Blog Talk Radio. Broadcasting worldwide from beautiful Santa Monica, California. It's time to get real. What makes someone rich and successful while others stay stuck in the grind? How can you maximize your potential, live your dreams, and build your wealth? Taking an honest look at our world and the markets that move it. Let's talk to successful people and take a look inside their heads. Let's simplify success and spread the wealth. Let's prove the American dream is still alive. This is Real Business Talk with your host, Los Angeles expert realtor and entrepreneur, Robert Crawford. Call in now, 347-205-9356. That's 347-205-9356. Make sure you follow us at realbusinesstalk.com. <laughs> okay, it's Real Talk about real business. It's Saturday, October 25th, 2014. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Real Business Talk. I'm your host, Robert Crawford. We have a great show for you today. Lots of important news happening this week. Before we get into that, our today's guest is Charles Contreras. Charles, are you there? I'm here, Rob. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, Charles is an entrepreneur and beverage expert who currently works at Combsaw inside the Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas. Uh, today, we will be talking about the food and beverage industry, Las Vegas, and the startup culture, and the lessons Charles and I learned from a failed startup called Clink, which is put on hold right now. I wanted him on today so we can share the successes and the mistakes we made in the two years we spent working on that mobile app network called Clink, which is K-L-I-N-Q. Um, you can call in to join the conversation by dialing 347-205-9356. That's 347-205-9356. Uh, so a little bit about Clink before we get into some news. Clank was a mobile application that allowed uh, users to buy and gift drinks. It was a network built to connect managers directly with customers and to allow customers to interact differently inside local businesses. Um, before we start getting into the startup culture, I really wanted to talk today about an article on Salon about the seven facts that show the American dream is dead. I thought it was really interesting because it really ties into the startup culture. Uh, we see a huge influx, especially in the millennial generation of people going out and starting their own businesses or joining entrepreneurs to create new projects instead of going the traditional route of a nine to five job. Um, a few topics that were in this article really stuck out to me. The first one was that most people just can't get ahead financially. The middle class hasn't seen its wage rise in 15 years. In fact, the percentage of middle class households in this nation is actually falling. Medium household income has fallen since the financial crisis in 2008, while income of the wealthiest Americans has actually risen. Charles, do you think this is true? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. So, like, really, like my own family, I can say that like it's hard enough for them to try and get ahead. You know, both working full time and trying to do their own thing. Like it's it's for sure happening. So, I mean, fifteen years of wage rises not having a single wage rise in 15 years for the average family, the average worker is a blow big enough, but even more importantly is the rise in inflation and cost of goods. So talking about the food and beverage industry, I want to move into that for a second. Have you seen a rise? Cause I think it's pretty noticeable to everyone, a rise of just food and beverage goods just on your normal day to day basis. Um, well, living in Vegas is definitely a lot different. Everything's uh, more expensive. You know, it's almost like uh, we're an island. Everything has to be flown in or in or whatnot. So um, it's a bit more expensive in general. But I would think that cost of goods-wise, yeah, it seems it seems like it's going up, uh, which in turn means that the customer is paying more. I mean, just a few statistics. 
that meat prices alone have risen over 15% just in the last 12 months. I mean, that's a huge increase. You saw it. I mean, now we can see it just on the dollar menu at McDonald's. It's no longer a dollar menu. I believe most of the items are closer to $1.50 right now. Um, and I think that that's really where it hits home the most because what we've seen, especially with the fast food industry, is their main clientele, I feel, these days is people that are making a lower income. They can't afford to eat organic. They can't afford to shop at Whole Foods. So they go for the cheap option, which is going to fast food establishments and being able to feed their family that way. Do you think uh, that's a correct assumption or, or is something? Well, yeah, for sure. That the, the middle class, the middle class is struggling and, you know, you have people holding down multiple jobs and at the end of the day, you don't want to go home and cook or you can't afford to go home and cook. You can't afford to go home and get good groceries. So you just stop off at a McDonald's on your way home, grab some meal for you or for the kids and everything. And it's just sort of like a downhill spiral really from there. Uh, that's what it seems like to me. So if this gap keeps increasing and now people are even struggling to make payments to pay, to pay for McDonald's for their family. I mean, an average meal these days, just at McDonald's is close to $7. That's not, that's generally the average wage for most people. Um, I know minimum wage, what's minimum wage right now in Las Vegas? Um, eight twenty five if you don't get insurance, Seven twenty five if you do get insurance. Okay, so eight twenty five. Now that's not including tips that go on top of that. But I mean you're talking you have to work an hour's wage a day just to pay for one meal. So you have to work, you know, two to three hours just to pay to feed yourself for that day. I mean, that's that's pretty staggering. Um more importantly, you know, just in this one section of the article, it goes to mention that not only has the wealth of the rich doubled since 2000, but corporate revenues are at a, at record level. More importantly, corporate profits aren't being taxed the same. We're seeing that a lot of these corporations are using tax havens like Apple does in Ireland to avoid paying most of these taxes. So especially now that we're seeing, I mean, just a few stats on, you know, the national level, from the government, this is from directly from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The national seven million Americans are now working part time but want full time employment. So what we're seeing is a huge increase in people trying to find work but they can't find full time work, so they're having to settle for part time. More importantly, the federal debt now has increased over a trillion dollars just since this time last year. And the national debt is almost at $18 trillion. That doesn't even account for the housing crisis or anything else, which if you add everything up, people are saying it's somewhere between $200 trillion and $400 trillion. Just to put that in perspective, I mean, a trillion, the $18 trillion is almost a million dollars of debt for every man, woman, and child in the country. So, if we need to pay back this interest and we're making less money and these corporations aren't paying the taxes, where is this going to come from? No, who knows? It's just uh, people extending themselves and leveraging everything they own to try and still hang on to uh, basically that American dream. I don't know. I think it's pretty messed up. I think it's just a, a big downward spiral. And there's only really so much like a finite amount out there. And the gap between the wealthy and the middle class and the poor just the wealthy just keep taking off. They just keep going. Yeah, and you're right though, these companies are making just crazy amounts of money and it's only going to the top one, two percent of their executive staff. What was it? GE paid zero and been hiding money in uh Ireland for, for years, years and years and years and in China too. They just leave it over there because they can't bring it back. Um the EU is after actually going after Ireland right now. So it's it's, it's messed up, but it's a downward spiral, and everybody's now almost almost like how you're born with original sin. You're born with debt. Like, as soon as you come out, you have some debt that needs to be paid off. You need to go, and, you know, and then you were talking about how the millennial 
start skipping college, which, you know, in retrospect for what I did, it's almost not a bad idea. You know what I mean? Most people are going to college these days not to get the job they want, but to create the job they want. Um, but it's almost pointless in a, in a sense because these kids are, are going to school, racking up massive amounts of student loan debt. And student loan debt is up crazy amounts in the last five years. I think you bring up a good point. Uh, there's another section in this article specifically how student debt is crushing a generation of non-wealthy Americans. More importantly, once you get up, get out of college, that the younger generation quickly discovers that the gap between spending and income is greatest for people under 25 years of age. Um, a Forbes columnist named Steve Odland put in 2012, saying that the American dream that college costs has risen 500% since 1985, while the overall consumer price index rose by only 115%. Now, that means that an average person is paying $130,000 on a four-year degree. And that's not counting food, lodging, books, or any other expenses. It's just counting tuition. I mean, that's some pretty staggering numbers. So we're saying that not only is the gap for everyone widening, that everyone's having a hard time, but especially people that didn't have a chance before but are now just getting into the economy, just getting into the point where they can actually go and create something, and they're being crushed by debt. I mean, has debt had a negative impact on your life personally? Oh, yeah, for sure. I got my college loans that I'm trying to get ahead of and trying to pay off, and you get, I don't know, what was it, like six, seven months, and then they start knocking on your door, calling you, texting you, emailing you like crazy, um, and look at it and it's sort of like oh okay well I guess that's not you know you look at your debt and it's obviously tens of thousands of dollars and you know now you're paying that off for the next 20 something years it's almost like a, a mortgage basically on on really a piece of paper and then you go out to interviews and that's all it is it's oh I learned this in school it's on a piece of paper on a resume and now you have to fluff it up and really try and make it look good for, for that employer. Paper you hang on your wall and then you write down what school you went to on your resume. Now, I think the, the bigger problem is there's so many college students looking for work at this time. I mean, you're having people trying to get these jobs and what that does just because of the market is that's what allows employers to get away with paying employees less. So I think you're seeing that that huge drop, especially with people in their 20s, because they can get away with it. So why would someone pay extra for an employee when they can get them, you know, a dime a dozen? I think that's a real issue as well. I think that's one of the main drivers. So as you're saying, all these people have this supposed college diploma now. You know, there there are definitely specializations where it's necessary. You know, if you want to be a doctor, you definitely have to go through the education for that. If you want to be a lawyer, there's extra education for that. There's there's specialization. But I think getting a general degree, you know, it's it's proving to not be a good investment when you're looking at spending one hundred and thirty thousand dollars that you're going to have to pay back with interest. Um, yeah. I mean, would you think that's a good assessment? Uh, so you have to look at the cost opportunity of just going out and getting a job at that point. If you're just going to university to study, you know, a general broad topic, it's it's pointless almost. You know, it's pretty much pointless at this point unless you're going in for like a master's or a PhD. And even then, you're just spending half of your life. It just seems becoming increasingly pointless because the market is so flooded with kids from college. And you spend four years in college not working doing, you know, studying, well, you could have spent that time at work and now you would look at an employer and you have four years of work experience. It puts you ahead of just about anybody coming out of school. And even if you are going to school and working at the same time, well, good luck with that. 
you know, it's it's going to be hard. I did it the whole time I was at school. I worked and went to school full time, and it put me just slightly ahead of of the rest of the pack, slightly. Just slightly. I mean, you got to imagine there's probably at least a quarter, probably even more than that, of the kids that are doing that same thing, working and getting their degree. Um, I would imagine it might be closer to 75 or 90 percent of people doing that these days. Um, so on that set, you know, it, it looks like the college degree may or may not be worth it. I mean, people have to make that decision on how they want to spend their time and money themselves. It could be a great opportunity for some people. But this is really, I think, what the driving force is behind the startup culture. And then people see companies like Facebook and Uber, you know, take off from just ideas that were really thought out of from some guy's bedroom and become multi-billion dollar operations. Do you think things like that are really like opening the eyes of some to take a second look at, at their possibilities? For sure. I mean, that's, to me, the, to me, that's the only thing that seems to kind of be keeping the American dream alive is that idea of now there's this gold rush of applications and, you know, everybody has a smartphone now and whether it's Android or iPhone and as soon as you have the next great idea or whatever, you can plug it into an app, turn it around, start it up, get it going and, you know, hopefully ride that out. And that's the only, only thing to me that seems like is creating like a fighting chance for like small startups. You look at Instagram and, you know, selling for a billion. You look at, you know, Facebook and how it took off from just an idea. You look at WhatsApp just recently sold. So you see all these little, these little apps just sort of coming out of nowhere and turning into something. And even though a small percentage of the general apps that are created even take off, but it's still, it's still something, you know? And still, this to me, that's the only thing really like keeping the American dream alive is the idea of these small, tiny little startups um, just coming up with one really good idea, knocking it out of the park, and uh, and creating something. Now, I think that's one of the reasons that drove us to uh, you know leave what we were doing to create Clank. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that experience. You know, let's talk about how we formulated that idea. Uh, first off, I think it really stemmed from our positions in the food and beverage industry. Um, you know, at the time I was working for the alcohol supplier, you were working for a major alcohol marketer uh, that worked with the major brands in Las Vegas doing promotions and menu development and a whole bunch of other items for the properties on the strip. And I think we really saw a niche of, you know, utilizing technology to improve the uh, experience when you are inside a restaurant or a bar. Um, so we put our heads together and, you know, spent some time developing this application that was available on Android and iPhone that allowed a local business to, uh, have their own page on the app that really was their own mobile store. So you could purchase through the phone a drink, whether it was, you know, a Bacardi cocktail, a beer, an iced tea, a coffee, and you could also send credits to your friends or discover new people at those locations and send, for example, you know, a girl a drink and, you know, break the ice that way. Um, Tell me a little bit about your opinion on, you know, why you were intrigued with that idea and the possibilities you saw when we first started this thing. Uh, first off, it was the name. I just loved the name. I thought it was really cool. Uh, and when you first showed me the logo, it just like, I could see it everywhere. I could see it on a billboard. I could see it on a cover of a magazine. I could see it on my phone. Like, the logo and the name to me was 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 huge. It just seemed to pop. And then from there, I mean, being in the food and beverage industry, the idea just seemed so natural. Like it seemed like a natural progression to where where Groupon, Living Social were trying to break into the food and beverage industry. And as much as the food and beverage industry wanted to, you know, welcome these these deep price discounts, they didn't want to welcome the 
you know, the hard cuts to their bottom line. And we came in from the industry building an app for the industry where really it just uh, made sense. It really did. It really just made sense. You know, the idea of giving away like a drink, a free drink or a really cheap discounted drink, you know, you get the customer in, you build a relationship, you talk to them and then you go from there, you know, and it was, it was part, you know, the establishments have to put up good, good things, good prices, you know, make their uh, establishment appealing on a small little page, you know, equal footing and the customer, you know, gets the, gets the benefit of being able to choose and then sending credits to people. I don't know. It was just a lot of really good ideas all tied in together and it, it just seemed to make sense and it seemed like it was a no brainer for sure. Now, I think one of the biggest things that, you know, you mentioned Groupon and Living Social, I think these things are really edging out small businesses. You've seen Groupon and Living Social in about the last two years really take a hit on their margins. They used to charge, you know, upwards of 50%, sometimes even more for that Groupon deal. So, for example, if you have a local restaurant near you and you bought a Groupon from them for, let's say, $20, you know, you spent $20 to get $40 worth of goods. Well, right there, the restaurant's taking a 50% hit, but they're actually taking a 75% hit because Groupon was taking 50% off of the $20. So they were getting $10 for $40 worth of items in their store. I mean, what we discovered was most of the time they weren't even breaking even and they were actually losing money on the Groupon deals. And more importantly, what our feedback was that most owners, I say almost all owners, thought that the clientele that it brought in was not a repeat client. So someone was coming in, taking advantage of these companies, and then never coming back again so they could uh, build a relationship. I think what was unique with Plink was the ability, you know, one of the biggest issues with any company, especially local businesses, is how do you capture information of your customers so you can stay in constant contact with them and entice them to come back into your establishment. And I think that was the, to me, that was really the main problem we were solving because each purchase on the Clink app directly connected that customer to someone, you know, to that manager. The manager could then see who that customer was. They can put a face to a name. They can actually reach out to them. They could send them a free credit if they wanted to, to redeem an item. They could send them a message to tell them about what's going on for the week. You know, there was a lot of benefits that opened up that communication. Um, do, do you feel the same way about that? Oh, yeah, for sure. I would say that just about every uh, owner we talked to didn't like Groupon or Living Social. Some had done it and hated it. Some had, hadn't even done it and hated it. Just the, you know, they, they got a call from somebody trying to sell them on something and they just, you know, immediately we're like, no, we, we don't want to take that. We don't want to do that. That came in with Clink, and we were able to sit down and explain it to managers. And we got we got a lot of, you know, forward thinking, you know, people who realize that, like, you know, yes, we do need to, you know, do something to get our name out there. Yes, we do need to do something to, you know, capture the data on these people. And, um we we were able to, you know, successfully land a few good accounts. Um, but really, I think that Click was uh, probably ahead of its time. I mean, all those things that you listed off right there, I mean, to, to anybody listening, they would just pretty much think like, wow, wow, that's, that's a lot. You know what I mean? It, it, was almost, it was almost like we did too much. You know, if we would have left it, left it more simple. Like, I, I completely and, agree. Let's take a quick break. And we'll be back to talk about uh, some of the mistakes that we made. We'll be back in just a minute. As part of Keller Williams Santa Monica, the largest brokerage in Los Angeles, the We Are Realty Group has a wealth of resources and expertise ready to assist with your next real estate move. With over $1 billion a year in transactions, we are 
fluent in the sale of real estate and the unique challenges of each property, consulting with your best interest at heart. That is why our bar is set to be your most trusted and chosen real estate. Ready to buy or sell your property in Los Angeles? Call me now at 310-363-0147. That's 310-363-0147. Find your next home at wearerealty.com. Okay, we're back. We just have three minutes left in this show. Um, just wanted to say one quick statistic as we're talking about startups that I thought was interesting was the increase in female entrepreneurs and female self-employed individuals that has risen 20% since 1993, which really is a huge increase of the female, you know, going out on her own and really creating something. So before we really start talking about that, let's talk about, you know, we obviously had this idea. Let's talk about maybe the, the top two or three things that looking back, we may have been able to do a bit differently to increase our chance of success. Charles, do you have anything? Um, to me, it's, it's hard. It's hard to just really sum it up. I think it was a, you know, long story short, there was a, you know, a few things that sort of, you know, domino effect on each other. But um, the number one thing I always wanted to do more of, and I wish we could have done more of, was uh, just m more events where we actually were at a venue with customers coming in, getting them to download the app, put money on the app, purchase a drink, get something for free, walk out of there with, you know, the app on their phone, load it up with some money so that they can go use it at the next place, maybe a T-shirt or a hat, and just a good experience overall. I mean, that face-to-face -face experience. Because that's what Clink was. It was. Clink was a social network that actually made you become social, not a social network where you sat there plugged into your phone and just liked and double-tapped stuff. So I really think that, that more of that, would have definitely been awesome. And the only reason we couldn't do more of that was either because of app bugs or budget. I think app bugs was a huge thing. I think finding a, a developer, we had a lot of issues with Android development. Um, finding your, a great developer if you're in a tech, tech startup is huge. And also, I think, you know, really being able to plan out that budget and stick to it. Um, I think the development obviously affected that. Uh, but other than that, I think those are really the two main things. You bring up a good point uh, with going in and really having a face-to-face -face marketing approach saturated with all other types of marketing. Um, just wrapping up the show real quick, where do you see startups going in the future? Do you, do you see them continuing to be a great opportunity for uh, the younger generation? Um, I don't know. Tough to say. What do you think? What are you talking about? Like five years in the future? 10, 15? I think, yeah, five, 10 years. I think creating a great idea is one way to do it. I think that you need to have a lot of resources. But we'll wrap up today's show. We'll be back next week, Saturday at 11 a.m. Charles, thanks for stopping by. This is Real Business Talk. Friends, the current economic system is set up to reward the rich and leave you with nothing. Stagnating and declining wages makes it harder than ever to achieve your dreams. That is why we've developed a platform to allow you to raise the funds for the goals and the dreams you wish to achieve. Dream Bucket allows you to set up dream campaigns and have others give towards your dream. Whether that dream is education, travel, family, or material items, DreamBucket.me gives you a tool to raise the amount you need from the people who care. 
kickstart your dreams by creating a dream campaign or two now. Just go to dreambucket.me to get started.